when it breaks. And so we're looking maybe in the August sometime before they're able to engineer the right fix to get this thing capped off. See, that's why we need God. That's why the church really needs to be the church and realize in the end we need him. In the end, we need him. In the end, we are dependent upon him. We can do nothing without him because he knows things that we don't know, those secret things he knows about. And before we get there, he's already been there and came back to be with us. Well, that's why the church is so desperately needed in this hour. And I don't know why it is that people think the church has become irrelevant, even most Christians. Oh, yes, we have something to say. And we will have something to say, and we will have the last word just before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Because we have to continue to point people to our utter dependency upon the living God. Are y'all listening to me? It's just a humbling thing when you go and get these little mini physicals in the first place. Because they start prodding you and poking you and and doing things to you that they should have to do to no grown man. Y'all listen to me up in here. And then they start telling you stuff, and you say, well, man, that that could be bad, and and that's too high, and and that's too high, and all this is too high. And then you start thinking about all the things that could go wrong with your body. All the things that have to work right to keep you, when you lay down at night, to be able to sleep, and to wake up in the morning, and to be able to get up in the morning, and you realize how dependent you are upon the living God. And I was watching a piece on CNN last night. And they were looking at this little community where this chemical company produces vinyl chloride and they have this uh, high, very high incident of cancer, in particular pancreatic cancer because that stuff gets trapped in the pancreas. And I said, we used to produce that right here in the Kanoa Valley in pretty large quantities at these Union Carbide plants. And surely a whole lot of people have ingested and taken it in over the years. And there is, in certain parts of the Kanoa Valley, there's a higher cancer incident rate than other parts of the valley. This is just the, the world we live in. If you're going to live in a society that lives on the edge of technology, then you always live with the danger that the technology creates. And sometime before you realize how dangerous the new technological advantages are that you've created is already just about contaminating you and you're ready to take you out. That's just the world in which we live. And that's why we need God. And we need his protection. And that's why we need to pray over the food that we eat. We don't know where it came from. We know how it was processed, what it went through, what the whole situation is. We are so dependent upon him. And now we're beginning to see that. And when you look at what's happening in the world through the lens of the word of God, when you look at it from a biblical perspective, you begin to understand that God is shaking the foundations of the nations. And so now we can try to explain things away if we want to, but God controls the weather. So earthquake in diverse places, when God caused the Big Bang and when God established the earth, God knew that the tectonic plates would shift at some point in time. It would create earthquakes and tsunamis and tidal waves. Nothing catches them off God. And we have to call people's attention to the fact you need him. You need him more than you ever thought that you needed him. And every now and then, these major earth-shattering events, they humble us. So we realize how finite we are in the whole big old scheme of things. Well, Paul understood that and Paul articulated that and Paul tried to always arrest the church's attention to their responsibility to be the people of God, to live out their faith, to be serious about it and not get caught up in the minors, but to focus on the major issues. People are lost and they're in desperate need to know Christ. And we got to be the best ambassadors, the best representatives we can to try to reach people before it's eternally too late. So Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. A church that was in the midst of one of the most decadent civilizations that ever existed. The city of Ephesus. The home to the goddess or the temple Diana or Artemis. Where Prostitution was a part of the whole worship of uh, Artemis and Diana as the temple prostitutes were there. And people thought the higher they went into ex, uh, to sexual ecstasy and arousal, the deeper they could commune with the gods. It was that type of, of degrading, debasing lifestyle the church of Ephesus emerged. And so Paul does not write to them and say, well, y'all got to go from 
picket and y'all got to go over here and protest and y'all got to go over here and file this. No, he said, you be the people of God. And some people are going to go to hell because they won't repent and believe the gospel. And your role basically is to warn people to flee from the wrath that's to come. And so when they stand before the living God, they stand there without excuse because right in their midst there was a testimony. And there were people that were trying to really live out their faith and live for God regardless of how bad things were around them. Are y'all listening to me? So in Ephesians 4, Paul says, I therefore as the prisoner of the Lord, of the bond slave of Christ, the Lord, he says, I beseech you, I plead with you that you have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So Paul's going to talk to them that they need the church and they need each other so they can learn how to walk right before the world. He says, you've got to walk worthy of your calling. You've got to live up to what you've been called to. Live up to what God has called you to be, the continuation of his life. Live up to the name that you've been given, the child of God, a disciple of Jesus Christ. You walk worthy. Well, Paul, how do we do it? How do we walk worthy of this high and noble calling in which we've been called? Out of the darkness into the marvelous and the glorious light. Well, he tells us. He said, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. The first thing, it's a walk of humility. With all lowliness, it's a walk of humility. Once we understand the grandeur and the majesty of our call, we understand how awe-inspiring our call to salvation is. It should not cause us to become more arrogant, but to become more humble. He's called us, not because we deserved it. He found us even though we weren't even looking for him. And he saved us. And so we walk in humility with all lowliness, with humility, and with, 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 with gentleness. And gentleness comes from knowing that you have power. If you know that you have power, you don't have to be aggressive. Because you know you got it. And you have it. And you can discharge it and you can exercise it. So, so you walk with humility and you walk with gentleness. And if you know that you have power, then it leads you to be more long-suffering. It means to bear up, bearing with one another in love. It's long-suffering. It's more than patience. When patience runs out, long-suffering kicks in. It's more than patience. Long-suffering says they ought to know how to know more, they ought to do better, they ought to live better, they ought to know better, but they aren't doing no better, I'm still going to hang in there with them. That's long-suffering. That's what loving mothers do. That's what big mamas and grandmamas do. They're long-suffering. They bear for a long time. They're like the weebles. They wobble, they don't, they don't fall down, they, they, they bend, they don't break. They have this spiritual elasticity. Their, their love seems it, to be it, overloaded. It Paul said, this is the worthy walk. One of humility, lowliness, and gentleness, long-suffering. We bear with each other because we're trying to help each other become better than when we found each other. Are y'all listen to me? We're trying to help each other to become better than we were when we found each other. And so we bear with one another. That's what marriage is. Marriage is discovering that the person you thought you were marrying wasn't exactly the person you thought you were marrying. <laughs> That's what marriage is. M marriage is coming to realize that this person has a lot of issues and a lot of quirks and a lot of faults and a lot of problems, and they don't seem to be getting any better. But I said, I do, <laughs> and I will. And I was foolish to say it before God and witnesses. And then I signed a piece of paper. And it's actually documented at the courthouse. It's on record that I did it. So what did I do? You bear with them long. You bear with them long. I tell you, my heart was, was torn this past week. I'm getting older because things start affecting me emotionally and, and viscerally. You know, they didn't seem to bother me before. But when I, when I saw in the newspaper that Al Gore and his wife, Chipper, were going to divorce after 40 years, 40 years, they served this country together. They served in the sins together. They've been a tremendous 
a role model of people serving and sacrificing to serve. You 